I'm Alan Morinas. I'm the founder and the dean of the Musser Institute. And it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you to the third week of our programming for this month of Elul that leads up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in the hope of really enriching this period for you so that the purpose of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the sense of renewal and the sense of cleansing, can become very effective for you. With that in mind, we're focused on a special theme for this third week, which is free will and change. Judaism asserts, and I often use the example of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to support that contention, that we are really involved in a process of personal transformation. And the idea of free will and change is so central to what goes on in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur when we actually do uh, put ourselves forward to open a new year that will be new and changed and transformed from the year that went before. One of the great teachers of the Musar movement, the altar of Novartic, he said the only thing that keeps us from completely transforming ourselves virtually overnight is rationalization. I would like to do this, but, and he says at one point, Lou, 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 but, 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 all the rationalizations that keep us from just stepping out and becoming the people that we really know we have the potential to be and that we want to be. But I often hear objections to that point of view. Some of them are rationalizations, but they're objections nonetheless that we're born into a certain family and we've had a certain education and a certain social class and a certain economic level and a certain cultural upbringing. We're not really that free. We can't just transform overnight. We get a great teaching from one of the people that we're going to be introducing you to this week as one of our daily teachers, and that's Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, who was a great Musser teacher of the first half of the 20th century. And Rabbi Dessler gives a teaching on what he calls the Bechira point. Bechira is free will, free will, and the point at which free will operates. He acknowledges we don't have unlimited free will, but at the place where we are in crucial things, we often have a choice. And very often that choice is to go towards a higher alternative or a lower alternative. And he brings a teaching that illustrates this beautifully. He talks about the material realm, say the realm of money and property, and he brings the example of two individuals. There's one individual who, raised in a good family, very trustworthy, very meticulous in regard to money. You could leave your money or your property in this person's care and you wouldn't have a, anything to worry about. They take very good care of it. They're very reliable, very trustworthy. And then he asks, but do they give enough charity? Are they living up to their potential in regard to generosity? And then he says, well, maybe they are. Maybe they are giving adequately. Maybe they're giving generously. He said, but do they give with a congenial demeanor. Are they smiling as they give? Are they scowling as they give? Are they giving, but they're giving in a mean-spirited way? Or are they giving open-heartedly? And he points out that even a person who comes from a reliable material background, or they're reliable in their material area, and they are generous in regard to their charity, there still may be a point of free will where they could do it one way, or they are free to do it another way. That is the Bechira point, the point of flexibility in their behavior. And then he brings a contrary example. He brings the example of somebody who is completely dishonest, somebody who is coming from a family of thieves, their parents were thieves, their grandparents were thieves, their uncles and aunts were all thieves. Thieving was just their way of life. What's yours is mine. That was not the point of much free will exercise for them. But he presents the scenario of one of those people being in the process of burglaring a home. And the homeowner comes home and discovers the thief. And Rep. Dessler asks, he said, at that point, would the person commit violence to free themselves from that situation? Thieving? No problem. That's a way of life. But violence? That's outside the realm of thieving, and in that area, they may have free will. They may or they may not. It is the place of flexibility and growth. 
And we have that possibility. No matter what our circumstances, very often we can find certain kinds of choices where we know very well we could do the higher thing or we could do the lower thing. That's our exercise of free will. It's with that in mind that we brought the practice for this week, which is kavanot, kavanos, which means intentions. One of the ways of exercising free will, and a very effective one, is to recognize a change one could make and then setting your mind, and maybe even setting a program, certainly setting an intentionality to do something in the direction of moving towards your ideal. Setting a kavana, setting an intention, is a very good way of using free will and the mind, the ability to choose, to decide, and then see that the behavior can follow once you've established a firm guideline of intentionality for yourself. So that's the practice we'll do that this week. That's the theme we'll explore this week. And I sincerely hope you'll join Avi and me as we carry on in this journey, which goes towards Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which goes towards purification of the heart and the complete transformation that really is our potential.